Good morning, Mount Zion. It's another beautiful Sunday morning, and we are coming to your homes right here from church. You may not be physically with us this morning, but I know that spiritually we're together. Um, we're still in a crazy time, but I believe that God is still in control. And I want to reassure you as you are watching the service today that God has your heart and your life in his mind right now. God is thinking about you. God has not stopped caring about you. And God still has a way to achieve his purpose and plan in your life. Rest assured that God is still in control. I want to welcome you this morning to our live stream wherever you are watching from i am encouraging you to comment right now whether you're watching on facebook i want you to comment where you're watching from i want you to also comment if you're watching on our church online platform that is mtznd.l.online.church you can comment there as well do me a favor as well this morning please share this message wherever you are i believe the gospel must be shared and today we have a word for you we've just come from the easter holiday and we're now continue with our series which is called break out uh, for those of you who don't know my name is pastor Mpangwe and I am the lead pastor here at Mount Zion Christian Center Ndola so wherever you are I'm so glad that you're with us this morning and we're going to get into our word this morning boy do I have a word for you so please please let's watch uh, the sermon together and also let's share wherever we are let's invite our family and friends right now do that for me I want to feel you guys online wherever you are tell me where you're watching from and I want you to share this and tag your friends in the service all right let's get into the word of God today we are reading today uh, from the book of Matthew 22 we're reading from Matthew chapter 7 sorry and verse 22 uh, the Bible reads this it says and Jesus also told them other parables he said the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by a story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son when the banquet was ready he sent his servants to notify of those who were invited but they all refused to come verse 4 it says so he sent other servants to tell them the feast has been prepared the bulls and fattened cattle have been killed and everything is ready come to the banquet but the guests he had invited ignored them and went their own way one to his farm another to his business others seized his messengers and insulted them and killed them let's continue uh, uh, and the Bible says the king was furious and he sent out his army to destroy the murderers and burn their town down and he said to his servants the wedding feast is ready and the guests I invited aren't worthy of the honor now go into the street corners and invite everyone you see so the servants brought in everyone they could find good and bad alike and the banquet hall was filled with guests let us pray Gracious and heavenly Father, we want to thank you, glorify, and honor you today. Lord, we pray that as this word is preached today, that it will change and transform lives. I pray for every anxious heart that you still and calm every storm in the name of Jesus. I pray right now that your presence will be made manifest in their lives, even over this broadcasting today. It is in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. This morning I am excited because I want to preach a sermon which is entitled change of plans change of plans I want you wherever you are right now to hashtag change of plans whether it's on whatsapp whether it's on Facebook or MTZ NDL online.church hashtag change of plans as we continue our series breakout cool you can park there for me and I'll come back to get you um, We've been in a series called Breakout, and I'm excited today because we're continuing with this series. And last week we talked uh, about a series called Don't Stay Safe. And I felt that I wanted to move on, but today the Holy Spirit really convicted me, or this week, 
to say, you know what, you need to break down what you said in that series or sermon a bit more. And I feel like there's no rush to get out of this series because this is supposed to be a challenging series and it is supposed to push us as the church to move beyond the four walls of the building. Right now, we're not able to meet physically, but we not, may not be in the same place, but we should carry the same spirit. So we're going to teach today on a sermon I've entitled Change of Plans. You know, the other day I was on Facebook, right, and I was checking out my memories. And sometimes some of my favorite memories that I see on Facebook are celebrations. Everybody likes a celebration. And, and I want you to know that God wants your life to be a celebration. Uh, the Bible says that he created or prepared a wedding feast. Uh, so God desires our lives be celebratory. And he desires that our lives to be a celebration of faith. In fact, if you look in the scriptures, the very first miracle that Jesus did was a miracle at a wedding, right? Where he turned the water into wine. Now, we're not arguing here about whether the water or the wine was alcoholic or not. That's not what I'm talking about here. But I think the whole emphasis is the fact that the very first thing he did was create a miracle in a place of celebration. Because God's intention is for us to be celebrated. Come on, I want you to hashtag and speak back to me and say, I will celebrate. I think our lives should be celebrated. I think God should be celebrated even in our lives that's why the bible tells us rejoice and again i say rejoice rejoice in the lord always because god wants us to rejoice and he wants us to celebrate so i was on facebook and i was checking out some old old stories and was talking about celebrations the celebration i did um it was a time when my wife and i went out for dinner and it was a memorable occasion and we chose to celebrate you know what there's something always that whenever you celebrate you don't want to celebrate alone Nobody wants to celebrate alone. And I think that that's God's intention, even with the faith, that when we celebrate, we shouldn't celebrate alone. That's why church has to be a place where people desire to come. Because the atmosphere must always be celebration. And whenever there's a service, wherever there's a gathering of believers, the heart of that must be celebration. Because remember, we've already won the victory. So if we've won the victory and Jehovah is our victory, you don't mourn victory you don't petition victory you celebrate victory so I want you to celebrate from this day forward wherever you are that you can choose joy right now you can choose happiness right now you can choose to experience the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living if you're with me I want you to say you're preaching pastor type in the comments wherever you are say you're preaching pastor there's some people here in the building with me I'm not hearing them they need to talk back to me say you're preaching pastor that's right that's right I need some energy. I need energy in this place. So, so it's always about celebration. You can choose to celebrate. But whenever we celebrate, we make plans. Nobody celebrates without making plans. Nobody celebrates. Whenever you want to celebrate, your initial intention is to make a plan. Let's go out. Let's go and do something. Let's go have a party. Let's go have dinner. Let's go do something. Because every time you have a memorable moment, you make plans to celebrate that moment. Here's what I want to tell you today. God has made plans to get closer to you. Somebody talk back to me today. God has made plans to get closer to you. We see this story here where God is telling us, Jesus is telling us about the kingdom of heaven is like a wedding feast. And so it was God who was making plans. The king was making plans for communion. He was making plans for a relationship. He was making plans for a celebration. God has made plans to get closer to you. So what is stopping you today from getting closer to God? It is not God's desire. It is us who have to draw unto him because he's ever willing to draw unto us. That's why the Bible says, draw unto me and I will draw unto you because he's always ready to get closer 
to us. He's always ready to know us better. He's always ready to reveal himself even more to us. That's what the Bible says, he who lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives liberally. So God is always ready to reveal himself. God has made plans to get closer to you. And, and, and here's how he makes plans. He makes plans by making a table. Uh, he makes plans by preparing a feast and preparing a table. This is what I want you to know. That God has already set a table for you. In fact, there's a scripture that says he prepares a table in the presence of my enemies. We always use that scripture to define that we're going to show our enemies what God can do. But I think that the heart of God is not about boasting. But it is saying that in the middle of trouble, God is preparing preparing a table it says that when the enemy is preparing trouble God is preparing a table I want you to write that down that when the enemy is preparing trouble or whenever there are trials going on God is preparing a table that's so powerful. And what that means in the, in the midst of adversity, in the midst of challenges, in the midst of tribulation, God is preparing a table. That's why we can preach this gospel so boldly to those who are in trouble. He says, come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden. He doesn't say, I'll give you work. He says, I will give you rest. And what God is saying is that he is preparing a table even when the enemy is preparing trouble. Some of you might be in trouble right now. Some of you might be in financial trouble. You might be in marital trouble. You might be in social trouble. You could be in employment trouble. But I want you to know that when there is trouble, God is preparing a table. That's why we need to be uh, uh, confident that in the midst of trouble, God is preparing a table. I want you to type back and say, God is preparing a table. Oh, oh, and I want you to be confident that at this table, there is a place for you. There is a place for you. Whenever we had dinner reservations, one of the key moments for a dinner reservation or a, a key moment for a celebration is a table. You need a table where you can convene and where you can celebrate. I believe God wants us to celebrate at the table. Here's the thing though. What are we celebrating? What are we celebrating? The difference between us and the world is what we celebrate. How many of us have been to restaurants? We may all be jovial in a restaurant, but we are all not celebrating the same thing. My question for you is at the table, what are we celebrating? Here's what we as a church have to be clear about. Yes, church is a celebration. Yes, church is a party. Yes, church is an atmosphere where lives are impacted and people receive joy. But the question is, what gives us joy? This is what we need to define. Where is our source of joy? And when God prepares a table, it says the king prepared a wedding feast for his son. The purpose is his son. We need to be clear that the purpose of our celebration is Jesus. That the heart of our celebration is Jesus. Look at what the Bible says in John chapter 12 and verse 32. It says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This is Jesus speaking. He says, when, am I, when I am exalted, I will draw people. So when we exalt the name of Jesus, God sends people to our church. He sends people to our community. He sends people to our connect groups. He sends people to our, our gatherings. Because when Jesus is lifted, men are drawn. I believe it is time for the church to begin to focus in these last days on the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. And that he has overcome every challenge 
every obstacle, every trial. If you believe it this morning, say amen. I want you to preach wherever you are with me. Say amen. I think this is the heart of the message of the gospel, that Jesus is the Son of God. Isn't it interesting that on either side of covenants, you have the old covenant, you have the gospels, and you have the new covenant. Why? Because Jesus is at the center of it all. That's why we have the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost because Jesus is at the center of it all. There's a song that we sing that says Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been about Jesus because Jesus is the center of it all. Listen, there are many religions out there and this is the difference. Religion is what removes Christ from the picture. Religion is what removes Christ from the picture. If Jesus has been removed from the God that we serve, then this is religion. Because before we received Jesus, it was religion. But when we receive Jesus, we receive relationship. For the Bible says that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came in the person of Jesus Christ. And we have been reconciled back to the Father because of Jesus. I want you to know that the enemy is not fighting your anti-God thesis. He's fighting the anti-Christ movement because let's put it this way. Jesus is Christ and the enemy is called the anti-Christ. He's not the anti-God. He's the anti-Christ because what is in dispute here is whether Jesus is the Son of God. And I came to boldly declare that Jesus is the Son of God. That he is the name that is above every other name that at the mention of Jesus every knee shall bow every tongue shall confess what? that Jesus is Lord I came to preach this morning to revive people and let them know that Jesus is Lord I don't care what they told you in your college or in your university I came to declare that Jesus is Lord they may have told you that they may not be the truth but my Bible tells me that he is the way he is the truth and the light he is the door he is the good shepherd he is the lily of the valley he is the rose of Sharon come on somebody declared this morning that Jesus is Lord that's what this is all about a reminder for all of us that's what was so powerful about the the, the, the early church all they declared was Jesus is Lord and many things happened many things these days we're trying to do so many things it's because we're not focusing on the mere fact that we're here to celebrate Jesus our lives as believers should celebrate Jesus and at the table at the table our celebration is Jesus that Jesus is Lord his relationship with us we celebrate and commune with Christ come on if you're with me this morning say that Jesus is Lord come on say it one more time say Jesus is Lord we celebrate that Christ is Lord uh, this is the second thing I want you to realize here is that the king says that he prepares this great table and then goes to invite people he goes to invite people here's what this is all about is that when you get closer to God you understand his heart I'm going somewhere with this. Whenever you get closer to somebody, you understand their heart. And, and here's the crazy thing, is that even though the purpose was to celebrate Christ, the heart was to commune with his children. The heart of the Father is always his people. We cannot serve God and not have a heart for his people. That's why I don't understand people who say, I don't like people. You cannot be a child of God and not like people. You may not be as expressive as everyone, but you've got to love people. Because the heart of the Father is his people. It's his children. The Bible clearly shows us that even though we proclaim his son, we are here to reclaim his children. Come on, you didn't get what I just said. We proclaim his his son in order for us to reclaim his children God doesn't just want one son yes he is the son of God but he says the Bible says that he is the firstborn of many so he wants many more children and when we proclaim his son the endeavor is to reclaim his children the Bible clearly shows us that when the father prepared or the king prepared 
prepared this wedding banquet he says go and invite many people go and invite the heart of the father is his people i want you to check this scripture out uh john chapter 21 and verse 17 i know it's not there john chapter 21 and verse 17 the bible says that jesus is speaking to peter and he says to peter simon peter do you love me and peter was hurt because he asked this question a third time and he says lord you know everything you know that i love you jesus said then feed my sheep we cannot love god if we don't take care of his people we love god by taking care of his people it's by taking care of his people that we show the love for god so that is why now as a church we have to rise up and begin to take care of the people we begin to take care of the church we begin to take care of his children because it clearly shows that god's aim is to reclaim his children here's where i have a problem with the church some of people have been saying things like you know what this virus is here to show the world who god really is listen i know the god that i serve god is greater than a virus and god doesn't need to send a virus to show people his god if he sent his son why would he need to send a virus it's saying that the virus is greater than the name of jesus christ god's intention was not to bring terror god's intention is to share his love and show his great love for his people how do we do that by bringing them to the table that's so important by bringing them to the table we show how much god loves his people by showing what he has prepared for them at the table and that's why he says peter if you love me feed my sheep here's the problem i have with the church sometimes sometimes we want to be selfish we want us to be blessed and everybody else to suffer we want us to shine and everyone else to struggle we want us to excel and everyone else to decelerate we cannot do that because we have to have a heart for god's people everybody is god's child he loves all he doesn't want any to perish so we cannot be a people that monopolize the blessing isn't it amazing how we fail to celebrate even the good in the world because we have a heart that is selfish we want to keep that meal to ourselves. i can imagine the guests or, or the servants that day at the table seeing all that food thinking we are about to eat only to be told go and invite other people come on man only to be told go and invite other people they must have been like what master isn't it our turn to eat haven't we labored haven't we struggled haven't we pushed and the father or the master said go and invite others and you know what that's what we do every sunday some of us jumped on this live broadcast right now with not telling a single person that there is a table that has been set for you on this broadcast some of us come to church every sunday without inviting a person that's the same thing like the king preparing a feast and nobody coming to partake of this meal today i came to raise an army of people that are ready that are ready to declare the bold of Jesus Christ and invite people to the table to partake of the meal to partake of the blessing to partake of the goodness of God because we are children of God we are co-heirs that are partaking if the, the blessing come on I want you to scream at me wherever you are I'm inviting somebody come on scream at me wherever you are I'm inviting somebody it's time for us to, to stop being insecure there's enough at the table table for everybody there's enough to go around and it's time for us to be the church that says there's more than enough the reason we don't invite people is we think there isn't enough and if the blessing goes to somebody else it might skip me but i came to let you know that my god owns a cattle on a thousand hills meaning he is never short my god shall supply all your needs not according to your bank account not according to economy economic forecast not according to the conditions of this world not according to the projections of the IMF not according to the projections of your government but according to his riches in glory where we come from there isn't a shortage where we come from we're not in short supply I 
came to let you know that there was more than enough at the table. And I'm inviting you, you and your auntie and your mama and your uncle, everybody that's connected you to come and eat at the table. It is time. It is time for us to invite people. We cannot be close to the Father and not have his heart. His heart remains his children. He, here's the problem, and this is probably where I'm going with this, is that many of us would rather identify with the people that are eating than the people that are serving. And this is where all of us have a problem because to us, the kingdom of God is all about the ones who are partaking but not the ones who are serving. Look at your neighbor and say, are you serving? Mm. That's a very good question. Are you serving? Because God doesn't get his work around without the servants. Today I came to stir up a heart for servants because this won't come to pass until we become servants until we come to serve the world. You see, see, many of us are always thinking about the table <laughs> and thinking about how we can partake. But the kingdom of God is like a man or king who prepared a feast and sent out his servants. We need servants. We need people. And here's the thing about becoming a servant is that you have to Lay your life down. Lay your life down. People are not going to hear this word. This is, this is what I, I've come to realize. For many people, you know, I hear everybody on social media right now talking about, you know, this is the prophecies of 5G and, and how this is the end time. Duh. It's in the Bible. Of course it's the end time. I, I, I hear so many people talking about how this is the time where Jesus is going to come and these are the last days. Duh! It's already been declared that these are the last days. But if these are the last days, what should be the posture of the church? The posture of the church should be servanthood in this time. The posture of the church should be becoming the church that serves his people. The posture of the church. This is not a time. Listen, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say this boldly. There is no prophet that is going to come here that is going to declare something that has not already been declared in the world. This is not the time for prophecy. This is the time for preaching. I know I'm going to stir up some feathers. This isn't the time for that. This is the time for preaching. Because the Bible says in the last days, the word of God shall be preached until the end of the earth then the Messiah will come. So in order for the Messiah to come, he's not coming with viruses. These signs are there to remind us as a church that while there is trouble, it's time for us to prepare a table where people can find refuge, where people can find healing, where people can find breakthrough, where people can find transformation. And, and, and it is time for us to become servants. Romans chapter 10 and verse 14 says it this way. It says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless somebody tells them? This is time. This is time. This is time for somebody to say something. This is time for somebody to declare something. This is time for somebody to preach the gospel until the end of the earth. This is time not for prophecy. It is time for preaching. What more prophecy do you need than the book of Revelation? It's already there. It's already been declared. So if we can see it's manifesting, why are we not doing something? But here's the thing. It's because we don't want to be disrupted. We, you see, being a servant means that you're ready for disruption. I don't know if you've ever been a helper. You could have your own plans. And I'm going somewhere. I told you that my sermon is called Change of Plans. 
Because I've realized what is stopping the church from breaking out is people that get saved but don't change the plans. You see, every person that went out to be invited, right, had a plan. And they didn't show up because they had a plan. They said, oh, I, I, I've got my farm. Oh, oh, I got my business. Oh, snap, I got work. Oh, I got my family. Oh, I got this. So I can't come because I have my own plans. Some of us seek God but hold on to our plans. We, we get saved, but we hold on to our plans. In other words, the plans that we have, that God, now that I'm saved, this is what you should finish off. Listen to me. I have never seen in the Bible where any man encountered God and continued going the same way. Whenever we meet God, there is repentance. Repentance. There is a change in direction. There is a turn around. Whenever we encounter God, there is a change of plans. There is a change of coordinates. There is a change of direction. That's why the Bible says many are the plans in a man's heart, but the Lord's will will prevail. I read this in the scriptures uh, or that, that many are the plans. In a man's heart. But the Lord's will prevail. I was reading a Bible commentary from Matthew Henry. And what Matthew Henry said was this. He says, The reason men do not repent is not that they can't. It's that they will not. It's not that they cannot. It's that they will not. What stops us from experiencing God is our own will. When our will supersedes His will, we create our own direction. Whose will are you following today? You see, if you're in the will of God, you'll be going to work. But if you're in your own will, you're going on towards your own plans. If you're in God's will, you're going towards people. Because His will is for people to be saved. That's why Jesus said, man, I didn't plan for this. But he says, Lord, if you can't take this cup away from me. But he says, nevertheless, not my will. Because that is the thing that stands in the way of us being a servant. Our will. How do we respond when God changes plans? How, how do we respond when God changes coordinates. How do we respond? Because the true test of dedication is disruption. I know you can go to gym when the gym is open. I'm preaching. <laughs> I know. We, we have a fitness group. Some of them, I'm, I'm looking at them right now. It, it, it's easy. When everything is open. Are you still doing your fitness? When you're by yourself. The true test of dedication is disruption. Lord, I love you. The true test of dedication is disruption. Do you love God when he's ready to disrupt your plans? I can imagine the servants. They were busy doing other things. They said, ah, I want you to go and do this. You see, when you are a servant, you must be ready for your plans to be disrupted. All those that didn't come to the table, the place of rest, the place of breakthrough, the place of provision, the place of healing, that table, were those that held on to their plans instead of seeking his purpose. I was sharing this with some guy I know I'm over time I want to go quickly I was sharing this with one of my young guys here shout out to the kid I was talking to he knows himself and, and he, he said he said he, he wrote a meme and it says do what you love and I was like that's not true because you will not always get to do what you love but you can always find love in everything you do and I said this because I don't think Jesus was loving to die I don't think he was at the cross dying. I'm like, whoa, this is powerful. I love dying. No. 
No, but the Bible says, for the joy that's set before him, he endured the cross. You see, love must drive you. You, you see, if you just do what you love, you use people. And that's the challenge with many of you. You use people just to get what you want. Get what you want. Get your will. Get your way. But when love is using you, you love people. Today I want to pray for everybody. That the heart of a servant is what God is looking for. Change of plans. Are you ready to have your plans changed? Yeah. 2020 was supposed to be the year that I start my business. Change of plans. 2020 was supposed to be the year. For some of us, we, we, this was the year we said we're going to do two services. Change of plans. Can I still love God when plans change? Because His plans will change, but His purpose will never change. My plan, sorry, can change. But his purpose will never change. Look at what John 13 verse 38 says. Jesus answered them, Will you lay down your life for my sake? This is Jesus talking to Peter. Saying, Peter, will you lay down your life for me? I think that's what God is asking us all today. Will you lay it down? Will you lay that idea of who you thought you were? Will you lay down that idea? I'm, I'm a person that has laid my life down. I'm not perfect. I didn't plan on being a preacher. I, this, was not, this was not the plan. I'm looking dead into the camera today to let you know. This was not the plan. I was supposed to be famous. I, <laughs> I was supposed to be a musician. I was supposed to be a DJ. And I was very good at it. It was just not my purpose. I'm here because of a change in plans. God changed his plan, changed my plans so that I could find my purpose. Many of you are not finding your purpose because you don't want a change of plans. Will you lay down your life for my sake? The idea of who you are. This is what's going to make the church break out. When people see us and we're saying we are dead to ourselves. We are put it to serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm wrestling with this idea. In the last days I'm praying a lot for, for businesses, praying a lot for people. Because, but I want you to know this. That God's agenda remains his kingdom. If he blesses you, he has his kingdom in mind. When he prepares that table, he's going to call people to that table. Don't get mad when they show up at the table. You get a big house, don't get mad when people start asking to stay at your house. You get a car, don't get mad when people start asking for lifts. You get a job, don't get mad when people start asking for help. That's God's plan. May not be our plans. His plans are higher than ours. His ways are greater than ours. Father, we want to thank you, glorify, and honor you. We lay down our plans, our will, our life today in the name of Jesus. There's a song that's on my heart. It says, I give myself away. Give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. Oh, I give myself away so you, here I am. We say, Here I am. Here. I stand, Lord, my life is in 
your hand Lord I'm longing to see your desire revealed in me I give myself give myself away oh God I give myself away so you can use me I give myself away Give myself away so you take my heart, take my life, take my heart as a living sacrifice. Listen to this, it says, On my dreams. All my plans, Lord, I place them in your. I give myself, I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. I want you to pray after me today. If you're saying, Pastor, I am a sinner. I've been living my own life. I don't want you to understand this. That the Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. I've realized that sometimes sin is going our own direction, our own plans. I came to preach this word today, and I pray that many will make this decision. Father, we thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. I want you to declare after me. Say, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. He died for my sins. Past, present, and future. From this day, I make a decision to live after you. From this day, I ask Holy Spirit that you will live in me, renew me, and restore me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.